All right, I'm here with Trish Ennis, and you have had a really cool journey in safety. I mean, you have amazing stories. You have worked some of, of the neatest places, and I just, I think you're really inspiring. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so tell me, tell me why you love safety. Why is it a passion for you? Because you've been in doing this a long time. 30 plus years. Yeah, yeah. you so might like it. I do like it. <laughs> I like it. I like, I think I mentioned in an earlier conversation, it's kind of like seeing the Wizard of Oz. You get to pull the curtain back and see what's behind the curtain in the organization. As health and safety professionals, risk management professionals, we get to work at every level of an organization. So yes. some of the fun projects have been the Pepsi Center in Denver. I got to see it from the ground up. The new football stadium ground up. Really? The, the um, yes. Yeah, like the, the How cool aquariums. How cool is that? You know, working in that construction industry that people are building things and creating things and you get to see it in process. Yeah. So it changes the way you look at the facility forever, which is really fun. And you see the problem solving, the creativity, the nimble decision making that happens in the construction industry from start to finish. And I really do like that. So I would just, I mean, there has to be so different from building to building, industry to industry, right? You have an aquarium right. and then you have the Pepsi Center. Right. I mean, is is there, are the processes the same or is it different because of where, because of what it is? Some of it is the same, you know, dirt work a lot of times is dirt work. You know, okay. they're moving a lot of dirt trenching and excavation, you're doing shoring and con and concrete work. But then you get into some of the finished products and what kind of technology is in there? Does the roof have a certain suspension system that mm. poses challenges in creating that or building that? Um, with the aquarium, the concrete work in there, the, they're artisans, you know, they create trees and vines and it makes it look like the river bottom. So that's really interesting to see that it's construction and art at the same time. Oh, yes. And I really liked, I really like that. Yes. I worked at Denver Zoo. That was amazing. You know, it's kind of like working for a municipality with wild animals mixed in. Was you know, that I, amazing? It was amazing. I got what was to, your favorite part about that? I think working with the keepers, the zookeepers. Okay. You know, zookeepers are singularly passionate about the work that they do. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of time going to school. They spend a lot of time getting educated, even volunteer work to get into an accredited zoo so they can shovel poo and like throw hay <laughs> for six hours a day. And that gives them maybe two hours a day to really work with a species that they're passionate about. Wow. So they don't get paid a lot, but they're very, very dedicated to their work. And when you go in and say, I'm the new safety director, they're thinking you're taking all the joy out of my life forever. And yeah. it was really challenging to learn how they did their work, help them make safe decisions without taking all the joy out of it. And I think that's safety in general. Okay. People do things. Sometimes people take risk because it's exciting. And if you take all the excitement out of their job, they lose that passion. And mm. so... How do we work with people to keep them safe without them losing passion for what they're doing? That is a really good insight. Yeah. So did you have to learn? Okay. I'm just trying to think about like working with safety and animals. That is so different than I think. I mean, there's a whole new component to that. Did you have to learn about the animals? I did. Because mm -hmm. that this animal has a different safety process maybe than this animal. Or a different net process necessarily, but the way well, that to keep them safe. there are different risks, certainly. Okay. I mean, it was a very complex environment. So I did job shadowing. A, a condition of my work there was that they let me do job shadowing for three months. And, and that was with everyone. You know, even the maintenance and facilities people there, you really had to understand what are they doing? How is it impacting not only their safety and the safety of the keeper, but the safety of the animals? Wow. And so, you know, I, I would tell them, you have a lung this big and this is the respirator you wear. The golden lion tamarind has a lung this big and they don't have a respirator. So we need to do ventilation. 
And they wouldn't do it for themselves, but they would absolutely do it for the animals. So, I mean, you just have to learn how to position your argument to get yes. the outcome that you want. It was fun. Yeah. Wow. What was your favorite animal that you got to play with, work with, play with? Well, they don't really play with the animals very much. I mean, they're not tame. Well, it's... But I did get to see a giraffe be born, and that was really, yeah. For an animal that starts life as a face plant, I mean, they're really pretty friendly. <laughs> they're pretty happy. <laughs> so they just, wow. they drop from the air. <laughs> so Face planting. Yes. I mean, they're just like, boom, they hit the ground, and then they get up. They're amazing. Oh, my God. Yeah. It was It was a really... It was an interesting environment. Um, very passionate people work there. They do a lot of good conservation work. So everything about that job was really fun. Okay. Yeah. So your now, so your passion is really about unveiling the curtain. Why does that excite you? What it, what is it about looking kind of at Oz that excites you? I think. In our organizations, frequently people don't understand the context of the organization. And if they don't understand the context that they're working in, they don't always know why the things we're doing are important. What, how do I fit into the bigger picture? Why does my safety matter? What decision am I going to make today that's going to have the ripple effect throughout the organization? So when you get to see behind the curtain and you understand how things work, you get more of an idea of the context of the organization and you can be more effective and you can convince people why their what they perceive as a small role might matter so much. So I love this yeah. so much. You are so inspiring. Thanks. I'm so glad to know you. And um, one last thing and then we'll close. You are a part of, was, it was Colorado Safety Association. Now it's called HASC Colorado. HASC Colorado. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how could you encourage people to get involved in organizations and safety? And what is the benefit of that? Getting involved with organizations and safety. So I have a long leadership path with the American Society of Safety Professionals and also as a nonprofit leader. Many times health and safety professionals are the only person in their department. So getting involved mm -hmm. can give you access to other professionals that will help you be successful. The other thing I would say is that oftentimes volunteer roles give you access to, to leadership opportunities, serving on a conference planning committee, being on a finance committee, doing strategic planning that you may not have access to in your organization. Mm -hmm. So if you can volunteer, it's not paid work, but it's still experience, and that goes on your resume. I like that. And then, you know, what is the what is the benefit of the networking there too? Because, like, like you said, they're pro they could be the only person at their organization, right. and now they have access to all of this this breadth of knowledge. But they have to lean into it. You have to step forward, and that may be uncomfortable, but the right. but the connections that you're going to get is invaluable. Yes, leaning into it, stepping forward is important. But I would also say to everyone, if you have people in your network that you know is they're qualified, but they're not confident enough to step forward, reach out a hand. Oh, I love you know, that. Invite them in because a lot of times people need to be invited to participate. Oh, I love and that. And once you invite them and they get that passion, then that helps them be successful. The, the, yeah. the introverts that are scared to death. Exactly. Cause I'm an yeah. extrovert and I get scared to death sometimes to walk right. in the, the door. Cause yeah. I'm like, why am I so scared? I literally want to unzip out of my skin right now before I walk into this door yeah. and I'm an extrovert and, and it doesn't that, and I'm not unique in that way. And so you're right. Yeah. Um, what about mentorship? Do you have any passions there? Yeah. I mean, ben mentoring is, is, it's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I think if you have a good mentoring relationship, you learn as much as you, as much as you give. So mm -hmm. I had a really, I had a rewarding mentor relationship through ASSP and he was in a completely different industry and from a different country. And so our conversations were very enriching wow. and we both got a lot out of it. I would say if you can have some structure around it, set up a regular time to meet, have an agenda, have some goals, it's a lot more successful than if you just sort of leave it up to, oh, let's talk because those don't always go anywhere. Having a little structure can be helpful. So this is really good for me to hear because my first instinct is to find a mentor that 
does what I want to do. And they're like strictly, I mean, obviously we want to align with people that like we have the same values and we have the same, but you're saying this person didn't, wasn't even in your industry and that helped you grow so much. And my, my thing is, okay, I need to find somebody that's like exactly aligned with where I want to go, but that may not grow me as much as maybe looking outside of that scope. Right. I think the more we step outside of our role and learn new things, the, the more enriching it is. And you find that things that people do in a zoo, for example, might work really well <laughs> in the oil and gas industry. It's a different industry, but the process might be similar or the technique is something you can adapt. So be strategic, be creative, step outside of your comfort zone and learn things. Go to a conference and take a session that you're not interested in. Oh, I love and this. And see if it opens a door. You yes. know, that, that's fun. So. This is so good. Just be yeah. curious and yeah. be like, you know what? Yeah. I typically pick right, but I'm going to go left this time. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Get lost. <laughs> <laughs> Fall off the path once yeah. in a while. Yeah. Very so, good. Oh, I yeah. adore you. Thank Thanks. you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm here with Daniel and we're talking about pallet rack collapse prevention. And you got some really interesting um, ideas on this. And, and you're really here to promote a lot of awareness about what to do differently when this happens. Yeah. Um, all right. So just go ahead and, and start and I'll just ask you questions as it goes on. Okay. So um, I'm in my 25th year of business. And for the last 16 years, I've been kind of consumed with the whole idea of stopping pallet racks from collapsing due to the sustained damage over time that they're uh, experiencing from forklift traffic. Okay. And a lot of people don't understand the fact that when a pallet rack falls, it doesn't just fall straight down, it lays over mm -hmm. and sets up a scenario chain reaction of a domino collapse across the space that it, the racks are stood in. Um, highly dangerous situation, lives are lost. Um, you know, the downtime associated with it um, is, is, you know, it's a very expensive problem when this happens. So. so typically what happens whenever this occurs, whenever you have one of these collapse, what has been happening and what are you suggesting that people do instead? Okay, great question. So what has been happening is people hit these racks and then they drive away, <laughs> hoping that they don't get blamed for it or they didn't get caught on a video and lose their job over it. Uh, but that's entirely the wrong response. We need mm -hmm. operators out there who are on forklifts, even though they may have had an incident, to be diligent about reporting it to the correct people at the site. Mm -hmm. So the right steps can be taken to mitigate the threat that they have just created. Because while these structures are engineered terrifically and they can literally defy gravity. I mean, I've walked up on it a number of times in my years where the, the vertical member is completely destroyed. It's not even in contact with the ground and the goods are still sitting on the shelves in place. Well, that can happen. Okay. Yes, it literally I can, can, I can understand because I of can how well they're engineered. That, right. right? Um, so what however, do people want to do? They've got the goods up there. Yeah. So instinctively, someone at the site tells someone else, you got to go get those goods off that shelf now. You got to empty that rack. Okay. And we're here this week at the ASSP in San Antonio to ask, look, can we stop putting people in harm's way? Can we okay. just stop that? And that's, literally. It seems actually logical for yeah, somebody not to go up there right. and get it. Right. But let, let the goods fall where they may. Okay. Don't put your people in harm's way. Just close the area off. So, so we're promoting a product here um, that gives a end user everything they need to secure the aisle the damage is in and the aisles adjacent to it on each side of it because any traffic can now hit that threatened structure and push or pull the system over starting this domino collapse. So one of the things we're here at ASSP this week is to begin raising the awareness that we're, we're asking people to, to simply stop going into harm's way, just secure the area and then call a professional. There's another solution we're, we're uh, showing here at this show this week in our exhibit where um, we can repair that rack literally 24 hours from your purchase order. That's a industry first. So why is it typically taking people to such a long time to come over and and repair these? Because there's only a few companies out here who are doing the work correctly. Um, 
the demand is through the roof. I mean, like there's so many damaged pallet rack structures in these buildings now because we've got so many buildings. We've got so many forests of steel racks stood in these buildings. We've got so many inexperienced forklift operators engaging these structures. And finally, they're all being pushed because the little lasers that they're using for their pick are basically timing them. And when they're not getting the picks done quickly enough, they get an alert or a push from, you know, their system saying you got to hurry up. So okay. it's it's a pretty stress filled situation these operators are in. I don't envy them at all, but it kind of sets up for this scenario. So so they'll they'll strike the system and because it didn't fall on them, they'll just drive away hoping no one noticed. And there begins the, the peril. Well, like I said, the racks can sustain damage. OK. But the problem is if the owner of the racks isn't maintaining the racks, isn't being yes. diligent about routinely inspecting the racks and, and repairing the racks, well, then eventually there's enough damage that one more hit in the system buckles. When do you suggest that there be a repair? As soon as possible. Well, I mean, you said it can sustain multiple hits. I oh, mean, right, right. So that there's there's a lot of physics involved, and I would be speculating okay. about such a, a question. But um, the important thing is is that you, you you can't be an ostrich in this situation with your head in the sand. You really need to have eyes open every single morning and. Look at those aisles, you know, oh, there's there's companies we go into and before the operators turn their keys on, they've got to walk so many aisles and, and do their own line of sight yes. view of everything. That's a great practice. And it just takes a couple minutes. But at least everyone is aware that something did or did not happen last night <laughs> because right. these facilities are running around the clock. So so like at some point in the operation, you got to stop and look. Is everything still okay here, you know? So have you seen, I'm, I'm sure that you have, but I guess, uh, I'd, you know, what have you seen when people go on to um, this rack and re and retrieve the goods? Like what what, what have you seen happen? If, if there, I'm assuming there's fatalities, slips, falls. Yeah. I mean, what, yeah. Yeah. What, what's the danger of this? Yeah, there's all kinds of situations that can play out. Um, so... Once the integrity of the rack has been undermined by damage, um, like I said, people instinctively will just say, go empty that rack. Well, now you got a forklift operator who's doing something that um, he's not confident in. He's approaching a damaged structure, right? So he's, mm -hmm. he's already in a, not a crisis mode, closer to a panic mode though, because he's the guy who has to go in. And so he's, he's, he's a little jerky in his movement. He's not fully focused on his elevation and he can very easily pull the structure over mm. on himself and, and there's the domino and, effect and there's your domino um but also yeah sometimes someone will just start climbing up in the rack which is again is a very dangerous thing if you're not tied off using some of the equipment that's on display in this room and you're just arbitrarily climbing around your your fall risk is through the roof and you'll be on the floor before you know it and injured pretty badly um so yeah it's 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 a very dangerous situation from all angles Absolutely. So. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your awareness on this. I appreciate your insight on this. And we'll put all your contact information on there for people to get a hold of you if they have any more questions. Okay. Thank well, it's been a pleasure meeting you today. Thank and you. Um, you we're going to look into your service and how we can uh, start to utilize some of what you're doing here. Thank you. To uh, possibly help out some of our own clients. I appreciate that so, very much. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you.